Good morning. Morning. Today we'll look at a lesson from John chapter 17. A lesson about prayer. And in the 17th chapter of the Gospel according to John, we find that Jesus is praying. And when he's finished, he and his disciples will cross the brook Kidron and go up the Mount of Olives to the Garden of Gethsemane. There, Judas will betray Jesus into the hands of the chief priests to be tried by them. And then they will hand him over to the Romans to be crucified. Jesus' consciousness of these unfolding events adds drama and tension to his remarkable prayer. Not in the fact that he prayed, but in what he prayed for. You know, it's, it's not uncommon for people to pray in difficult situations. But what he prayed for is more important as we look at the lesson this morning. Number one, Jesus prayed for himself. Do we take the time to pray for ourselves? To pray for the needs that we have? Uh, Jesus didn't have any problem with that. Look, look what he says, first five verses. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all who whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I have with, had with you before the world existed. So, any glory that Jesus would receive on account of uh, and for the glory was on account of and for the glory of the Lord. And I appreciate Danny's prayer again this morning when he talks about uh, us glorifying the Lord. You know, as we glorify the Lord, everything that he does, everything that he accomplished, and everything that we accomplish through Him is for the glory of the Father. Now isn't that an amazing thing? It's like a, a, a chain of events moving upward and onward. That every little thing that we do for the glory of the Lord results in the glory of God. Any glory Jesus would receive would be on account of and for the glory of the Father. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9. Jesus, in teaching his disciples, teaching us how to pray, says, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And that hallowed means set apart for holy use. Uh, don't take the Lord's name in vain is one of the Ten Commandments, right? You should not use the Lord's name in vain. It's very special. It's, it's holy, sanctified, and special. And it's special to us because that's where our glory resides in. Our relationship to the Father through the Son. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. For do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? That's the Holy Spirit. He's a gift from God. Holy, the Holy Spirit is one of the Godhead, but he's still a, a gift that we have for being a child of God. Paul goes on to say, You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Not just the words that we use in our prayers, but and everything that we say and do, what Colossians 3, what, se excuse me, 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Yes, everything we say and do, glorify God. Try to make it that way. 
But we, we continue on saying his prayer was a positive statement of the true relationship between himself, the Father, and mankind. <coughs> now, when I say mankind, yes, because all authority was given to Jesus Christ. He has authority over every human being. Not every human being is under his authority because they're in rebellion to him. But especially his called out, his church. What a, what a great relationship, a fellowship that there is there. Look what he says in verses 6 through 8. I have manifested, <coughs> excuse me, and that manifest means I've made known or, or made it obvious. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. Now remember who Jesus is talking about at this point in time. He's talking about those disciples, and especially those 11 that are with him at this time. Judas has already departed to go and betray him. But he's talking about those 11. He's talking about, what, the 120, which would probably include those apostles who meet in the upper room later uh, uh, on Pentecost. He's talking about those Jews that accepted him as the Messiah, who through the preaching of John the Immerser and through the preaching of Jesus and his disciples had repented and been baptized looking forward to the kingdom coming. They accepted that Jesus was the Messiah. So these were the people that God, they were gods, and now God is giving them, now understand the premise of God there, Father, Word, and Holy Spirit is giving them to Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah in that new special relationship under the new covenant. They were yours. You've given them to me. They have kept your word. They've repented under the old covenant. They get to be sent into the new covenant. But let's look at some of the positive things here, the positive facts that Jesus is using. Number one, he knew what God had done. He knew what God had done in the past. He, as a human being, God incarnate, He knew what happened with the creation. He knew what happened with Adam and Eve. He knew what happened with the flood. He knew what happened at the Exodus. He knows all of that, knew all of that, knew what God had done. And He knew what He had done. He knew what he had come to earth to accomplish. He fulfilled that mission. And he knew what his death would further accomplish, bringing about the new covenant, being the atonement for the sins of those faithful under the patriarchal covenant and the Mosaic covenant of the past opening up the gates of Hades and death so that there'd be no more fear of death for those who would come to God through Jesus Christ. He knew what the Holy Spirit would do through His apostles after His death. He knew that the Holy Spirit would be there to guide them. Remember there are times in his, uh, when he was talking to them, said, I, I have to go away, but I'm, I'm not going to leave you without a comforter. He'll, he'll guide you into all truth. He'll, he'll give you the words that you need to be able to accomplish your mission. Those are all the words that he was giving to his apostles. So it was a positive prayer that he was giving them. See, pessimistic prayer will not seek to receive God's approval. Matthew chapter 21, verse 22, 
Jesus said, whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Now, again, that's a promise directed to Jesus' apostles. Does that have uh, effect for us today? Well, uh, uh, to a degree, yes, because we ask in God's will. God wants to give us things, but again, it's always according to His will. Are we asking in accordance with His will? Uh, Mark chapter 11, verse 11 tells, you know, tells us, that's what he was, who he was speaking to. And sometimes what we, we do, or what people will do, to pick out things that where Jesus was talking to his apostles, like in uh, John chapter 11 through 17, or other places, and then try to apply them totally to the church today. And it doesn't work out that way. It's not supposed to work out that way. But the value of Christianity, the value of what Jesus was doing and what Jesus was bringing about is viewed in the following particular and is why it does not appeal to the mass of humanity. It's a system that could be, where it would be improper in probably 99.99% of all instances for us to pray for a million dollars. But it's more than appropriate every day to pray for our daily bread. Now you think about that. Uh, are there instances where it would be all right to pray for a million dollars? Well, well, maybe. Maybe it's it's a situation where, you know, somebody needs a million dollar operation. Which Lord somehow give us the the, the money, provide so that that person can have that operation or whatever. But not just, oh, Lord, give me a million dollars so I can spend it on whatever I want. You know, no, that's, that's, not the, that's not the way God operates. So this tells us God is above fleshly nature. But he's still able to sustain us in this life. In this life. And with thanksgiving, what is it mainly we're thanking him for? the material blessings of life that we've received through this year. And hopefully we've had a good harvest so far this year. And if you have a good harvest next year. So our God is an awesome God who knows our needs, provides everything that we need. So knowing his time was short, running short, Jesus turned his attention to his apostles. First of all, he prays for himself, which, sure, he had something big going on there, didn't he? But then he turns his attention to his apostles in verses 9 through 19. And here's the big thing, the interesting thing out of this. He did not pray for their escape. He prayed for their victory. He did not pray for their escape. Lord, get them out of this mess that I'm in. He prayed for their victory. John chapter 17, <clears throat> verse 15. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Not that the evil one would be kept from them. You see that? But that they would be kept from not going over to the evil one. And, and the problem being that uh, one had already gone over to the evil one, right? Judas had already gone over. He, he's already down there receiving his, what, 40 pieces of silver from the, the priest, ready to lead the, the Roman soldiers and the police from the temple. Basically, that's what they were to the garden where Jesus could be arrested. One had already betrayed, one had already turned to the devil, praying for those that they wouldn't do the same thing. God does not want us to be merely survivors. God wants us to be victors. He wants us to be overcomers. He wants us to be winners. All right? 
1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the what? victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's, that, that's where we really need to get to. That we, we need to be victors. And in order to be victors, we need to be in the fight. And there are so many that have a survivalist attitude. And you know what I mean by a survivalist attitude? Hey, let's just hunker down and maybe, maybe like God, <laughs> like the Lord, Lord passed over uh, Israel back in Egypt, uh, maybe the devil will pass over us. Maybe if we just hunker down, maybe the devil will not pay any attention to us, you know? Maybe the devil won't be attacking us. Maybe the devil will kind of slack off of us and we'll be able to slip through and be okay, right? I think if we have that attitude, the devil's already got us. We just maybe haven't realized it. Because God doesn't expect us just to survive. He expects us to be victors, to vanquish the foe. Isn't that a, 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 and a song that we sing sometimes? To vanquish the foe? Yeah. Disciples of Christ are to be on the offensive. Because Satan's not going to get tired. He's not going to give up on us. Unless he's already got us. Got us in his hip pocket, right? All right. We don't have to worry about them. Go on to some higher challenges. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. Listen to this. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Now, that every thought that we take captive, you know whose thoughts that is? That's our own, right? That, that, that's the place that we have to start is taking our own thoughts captive but then when, when people raise up opinions, well, I think this or I think that, we need to be able to challenge them about, oh, this is what the Lord says. You know, like we were talking in Bible class about, you know, uh, don't call any man on earth father, understanding that that's in the religious sense. Some people do it. They go, I, well, you know, Jesus said not to do it. All right. What about calling the preacher pastor? Well, here's what the definition of pastor is from John, uh, Acts chapter 20. Well, you can find all those things there. We have those answers, and then we can present them to them. Say, look, here's what God's Word says. And that's how we fight that fight. Uh, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they have the power to destroy strongholds. Destroying arguments, arguments that are, especially the arguments that are put out there against God and against the Lord. We've talked about it before. Historically, there's so much evidence about the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that the people who don't want us to worship God through Jesus Christ will totally ignore that evidence. But we need to know that evidence. <coughs> Satan has a willing accomplice in a silent church. A willing accomplice. So, yeah, we, we need to be victors. Winners. Finally, Jesus prayed for his future disciples, which includes verses 20 through 23. I do not ask for these only, talking about the twelve that were there with him at that time, 
I'm sorry, the 11 that were there with him at that time, but also for those who will believe in me, what? Through their word. What faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. All right? We believe that testimony. We believe what the Bible says. That, that's the only way we can truly understand about the life of Christ, what he came to do, what he died for, and what he expects of us. For those who will believe in me through their word. He's not going to come in a flash of lightning to make us believe. He's not going to come by some gift of the Holy Spirit to make us Christians. We have to come to belief by hearing the message of the gospel. Okay? That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you that they also may be in us. That sounds like 1 John chapter 1, doesn't it? We have come that we, you may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is in with the Lord, right? And remember what we talked about in Bible class this morning about uh, how that the Lord had led Israel with cords of kindness wrapped up, entwined, in fellowship. You see that here? That they may be, may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. Wrapped up there in a cord that cannot be broken so that the world may believe that you have sent me. If we are not joined in fellowship with the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and with all true believers in Jesus Christ, the world's not going to want to have anything to do with us. Because they won't see Christ living in us. They won't see the Holy Spirit guiding us. They won't see us glorifying the Father who is in heaven. So that's all very important. Verse 22, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. How do we know that God? Excuse me, that God loves us? Well, you know, what's the song say? The Bible tells us so, tells me so. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible, what tells me so? Well, that's true. Do we expose that in our lives? Well, to understand that, we need to go back to what Jesus says in verse 2 of, verse, of chapter 17. Since you have given him all authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. Again, all people belong to God, but not all people have eternal life in Christ Jesus. Why not? Because there are so many who are still in rebellion. They refuse to believe, or if they believe, they refuse to repent, or if they believe and they repent, they, they won't openly confess him, or they may do that, but they, they refuse to be baptized. So there are so many uh, religious groups that you don't have to be baptized. All you, all you have to do is call on the name of the Lord, even though Acts chapter 22, verse 16 says, hey, being baptized is calling on the name of the Lord. Okay? For some reason, people just won't do it. Jesus said in Matthew 22, 14, for many are called, but what? You are chosen. Call goes out to all, but those who are cho chosen are the ones who believe and obey the gospel. The gift of eternal life is available to every person, but it's granted alone to those who hear, believe, and believe the testimony. Remember, that's what we went back to, that they may believe their word, the testimony of the apostles who walked with Jesus 
and they obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, why, why is it necessary to believe and obey the gospel of Jesus Christ? Look what Paul says, Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. There is no other power of God for salvation. It's the gospel. And it must be believed and it must be obeyed. That's how the righteous live by faith. God the Father has given to God the Son, Jesus Christ, all who will believe and obey the gospel of Jesus Christ and live faithfully toward Him until death. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, that second part, what, what did Jesus say? Be faithful unto death, I will give you a crown of life. Well, oops. Yeah. Oh, touch screen. We can only share the glory of heaven if we share in the shame of the cross. Isn't that something? We can only share in the glory of heaven if we share in the shame of the cross. That's where ultimate victory comes from. The Apostle Paul explains this in two succinct passages. Number one, Romans chapter 6 verses 3 through 5. He says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Now, now we talk a lot about, well, you have to be baptized into Jesus Christ. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. But Paul says when we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we are actually baptized into His death. Verse 4, we were buried therefore with him by baptism into that death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united, oh, united with him in a death like his, what does that united mean? Remember that cord we were talking about, intertwined? When we get into the waters of baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, biblically, scripturally, He's there with us. We're united with Him like that cord. He's there. We meet Him there. And He performs an operation on us there according to the Colossian letter where He circumcises our sins away from us that we too might walk in newness of life. For if we've been united with Him in a death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Shame of the cross. What does Paul say? I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in, in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So not only are we united in that death, like that cord, we're united with him then in life. A resurrected life here. Galatians chapter 3, verses 25 through 27. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. He's talking to them about Judaism there, but he makes this application to it. For in Christ Jesus you were all sons, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have what? Put on Christ. Well, how have we put him on? <laughs> hey, let's go back to that cord analogy again. He's wrapped right around us, isn't he? And we should be wrapped right around 
him to. So these are the people the Father has given to Christ Jesus for eternal salvation in the new covenant. Those that he's wrapped around, united with his death, united in his resurrection, seen in baptism for the remission of sins in his name. We are wrapped around him. He's wrapped around us. That's who his people are. That's who's been given to him. So John chapter 17, verses 24 through 26, Jesus says, I, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, we know who those are now, don't we? May be with him, or may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. Beautiful prayer. A glorious future awaits those who choose not to continue in rebellion to God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ, but believe and obey the gospel by repenting and being baptized by the authority of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. That's what Jesus prayed for. That's what Jesus prayed for, for us for, that we would believe and obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. If you have a need, please let your request be made known as we stand and sing.